Hey y'all, welcome to Sex Ed For You, the podcast where research meets reality. I am Lauren, a certified holistic sexuality educator. And I'm Holland, and I have a Bachelor of Science in Public Health. Sex Ed For You's podcast is for people who want to date and have great sex that is fun and safe and enjoyable. We like to empower our listeners to make informed decisions that lead to values-based living. Y'all, we're coming at you live with new hair. Doubly. If you're watching on YouTube or Spotify, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> we got haircuts. We have been talking about this so for long. so long. Ridiculously long. This is the problem. Best friend Jay lives in New York City. Yeah. And has trimmed my hair since the pandemic because... He's always been incredible at hair, but came home during the pandemic from New York City to, like, take himself to hair school. Like, why not? And so we would meet up masked and all this stuff, and he started trimming my hair. And then it was like, oh, well, he's so good. How about every, I don't know, three to six months when I see him, he just trims my hair. It yeah. was great. It was fine. So you move here, and you're like, so who cut your hair? It's a natural question. And I'm like, well, there's the thing. But then he came to town literally as soon as you moved here. Yeah, I saw him on like day three. Yeah, he was like one of my first people you met. And I think we both were like, well, maybe we'll get a hair trim then. I think he had even said like, Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. I think he was here for a whole week. It just didn't work out with all the chaos. And then we just entered purgatory with no haircuts. Purgatory. It was bad. Yeah. And then we finally decided because I was like, I finally found what I wanted to do with my hair, which was this pink balayage thing in majiggy and this Renee wrap cut, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, a little bit less than Renee as far as the bangs, but the Renee wrap cut. For that- my 23 years. Mm-hmm. Y'all, it's going to be Holland's birthday by the time you listen to this. It is. Holland will have turned 23. Happy it's- birthday. Thank you. It's my Renee rap year. I'm so excited to oh, enter this fun. era mm-hmm. of self-discovery and love. <clears throat> love it. <laughs> and a little bit of gayness. <laughs> so Holland books her haircut because she finds what she wants to do. She asks a good friend for a recommendation, finds an incredible person. Mm-hmm. And that put enough fire under my ass because I was like, well, we, I need to step it up. Like this is – I've got to get a haircut. Holland's going to have good hair. Lauren has to have I have hair. to. It just makes sense. So here so we are. Here we are. Hair. Our new intern this morning was like, I can't believe you didn't tell me that we, need, we were all getting haircuts. <laughs> Surprise. By this time this comes out, you all will also know that we have a new intern. We do. Very exciting. Very, very exciting. Yeah. Welcome, new intern. Hey, girl. We'll wait and let you introduce yourself on the different platforms. How do you feel? I'm calling this your intern, everyone. I'm calling this Holland's intern because I was very clear with Holland when we started building this business that building a business is a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And I have a full-time job, Mm -hmm. which is making the money for sex ed for you. And I don't mean that lightly. I think a lot of us like stray away. We're like, ooh, that's awkward. No, I truly believe in the work that I do. And I love it with a passion. And I want to continue to provide top quality, comprehensive sexuality education to our clients because they are paying me. And I like take it really seriously. So I remember telling you in the beginning, like, I didn't really have time (laughs) to like also be HR and also onboard and also do these things. And if you want to make it worth it, let's go. Then you just blew me away. Blew me away. So anyway, um, about August of last year, we started really manifesting. Like, yeah. we need another intern. Because by that point, you were working part-time with us. And we were just we were building things. And yep. you were doing tasks that were, in business world, like advancing the needle, like pushing the needle forward. Yeah. And we needed somebody else to come in and do the basic, very still important tasks yeah, absolutely. that you had been doing mm-hmm. that you just didn't have capacity for anymore. Yeah. So we started yelling in a golf cart. We did. We literally screamed. Mm-hmm. That was a good time. It was a great time. I we loved were our all, golf, golf we were, cart rides. We were also very exa- exhausted after being in we business classes all day, but... Yeah, we yelled at the internet. I mean, at the internet. Into the, like, universe. universe. (laughs) And then one day, kind of towards the end of last year, I think coming back from New York. Maybe I did an Ask Me Anything in little anonymous question boxes. Yeah. And somebody said, what are you looking forward to next? Or what are your biggest needs, maybe? Yeah. Was I said for you? And I said, Holland and I are ready for our next intern. I just, it was like one little story. Yeah, you mentioned it. And I said, email admin at sexedforyou.com and if you're interested. She did. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> this person saw. Okay. So today we started. How are you feeling? How am I feeling? Uh-huh. Oh, good. I got really excited this morning. Um, I have a to-do list of a bunch of things that I need to do, a bunch of things that she needs to do. Um, yeah, I I think it's hard for me to wrap my brain around it mm-hmm. quite yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll see. I'm so – I know that I am naturally – this is a weird tangent, I guess. But naturally, I know that I can lead people. Mm-hmm. But I also do it – I don't have, like, a leadership style of, like, I am in charge. Mm-hmm. I am very much, like – I'm your friend (laughs) and Mm -hmm. we're going to do this together. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes I get a little bit self-conscious about the way that I am not, I don't see myself as a patriarchal, typical type of leader. And that feels like a self-conscious spot for me rather than a strength. But I know that you're going to be like, that's so good. (laughs) Fuck it. (laughs) (laughs) No, I just think it's actually like a kind of perfect segue into what we wanted to talk about today because I think there's so much of our lives that we lead thinking we should be doing something a different way. Mm -hmm. You are so right. Speaking of. I wanted to talk today. You ask me often before we sit in these chairs, like, is there anything that's coming up for clients consistently? And one of the things that consistently comes up in seasons is I want to want to have more sex. Let me say that again. I want to want to have more sex. Yeah. Not just I want more sex, Mm -hmm. right? Or I am having lots of sex. I'm just not orgasming. Or I want to have more orgasms when I have the sex that I'm having. Um, Or I want to find a partner who will give me better sex. Specifically right now, this question has blossomed up again. I want to want to have more sex. And I think that kind of ties into your little thing that you were just saying of I want to be a different type of leader, yeah. right? Instead of just the leader that you are. Before we get into it, and I want to hear like your personal anecdotes, if you hear this with other people or what your general like take is on it mm-hmm. as an almost 23-year-old human being, I find that its root lies in the fact that we literally used to have a disorder that we would put on women who thought they had a low libido. Yeah. And it was called hypoactive sexual desire disorder, HSDD. Like all things like this, um, they get introduced, people catch on, they start teaching it. Maybe they go to medical school or psychology school and they learn about this Mm -hmm. then they don't pay attention when it is recanted it is literally struck from it used to be in the dsm now it's not it was moved away yeah it's definitely not in the dsm5 no (laughs) it's gone it's gone okay because we realized that for most people and rosemary basson teaches this with her what i call the carousel (laughs) model of sexual desire that For people with vulvas and clitorises, most of the time, our sexual desire is responsive, Mm -hmm. not spontaneous. Yeah. That give us some erotic literature, give us a sexy partner who we're like watching cook us dinner, Mm -hmm. (laughs) give us the right thing for us to turn us on. Yeah. Or give us a really great haircut. Yeah. Or take us to the gym Mm -hmm. and make us work out. Um. Let us win a obstacle race. I don't know. It, yeah. it, we're all built so differently. But mm-hmm. give us the right thing that turns us on. Mm-hmm. Let us feel desirable. Let us desire. And then what do you know? We want sex. It's there. Yeah. But when someone tells us, you don't want sex with me enough, go to the doctor, see what's wrong with you. Yeah. Oh, God. Instead of how can I mm-hmm. attend to your needs? hmm Mm. <laughs> anyway, audience, do you see how this connects so closely to Holland's being like, I don't lead like a patriarchal leader. Egalitarian um, equality across this whole world doesn't look like people with vulvas needing to be people with penises. Yeah, we don't have to conform. No, like, no, <laughs> that it, it, we don't need to be wearing 
mask presenting clothing and feeling as spontaneously sexual as a person with a penis does. Hormonally, it is different. Mm -hmm. How we are made, how our brains are wired is just different. Yeah. I no. I just, I reject it. It feels like the deepest entrenches of patriarchy and capitalism. And I'm bleh, just, I want to like throw it out the window and scream. Yeah. So what's the first thing you say to clients when they bring this up? That I don't want them to want to have more sex. <laughs> and how do you explain that? <laughs> Which sounds like a really bad business model. That's literally what I say to them. Because usually it happens at a 15-minute consult. I want to want to have more sex. And I'm like, well, okay. Well, I don't. And they're like, what? <laughs> and I say, I just want you to have more of the sex that you want. Yep. That's all. Yep. And they're like, what do you and mean? And then that blows their minds because they're like, I don't know what kind of sex. What do you mean what kind of sex do I want? There's only one kind of sex, you know? Yes. And so then it's opening that door and that like Pandora's box of I can want a specific type of sex. Yeah. I can want different kinds of sex. I can like let my brain and my body feel into what I want in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And that is like a concept that I think not everybody is privileged to. Oh. So having that question posed back to them, I think is such a beautiful it's the best work. It's the very best work because I think also, and this is something that kind of came up in New York as well for us, is some people will tell me, I want to ha want to have more sex because I'm in the best relationship of my life. Mm -hmm. And now I don't want sex. Mm -hmm. Right? Some people will tell me, I want to want to have more sex, but my partner drives me insane. Mm. Okay? And as sexuality educators... It's our job to fill into feel feel into the nuances of this, yeah. Because there are so many different things at play, and it's why I deeply believe that the education that Sex Ed for You provides is not cookie cutter. No, absolutely not at all. No. Because every human being is different, and the different things they're presenting with are different. Their story is different. Their background is different. Right. So many of us have traumas. So many of us, our very first educators were our parents. Yeah. You and I have been talking about this a lot, right? Like, okay, if your very first sex educator was your parents or your guardians, ooh, what does that mean? Yeah. Right? What did they teach you about how we relate to one another? How, what did they teach you about how you show up in relationship? Mm -hmm. And what are you using sex to just perpetuate? Yeah. And like, it's not even when we say, what did they teach you? We don't even necessarily mean, what did they sit you down and tell you? Uh -uh. We mean, what did you glean from mm -hmm. watching them? Yes. What did you begin to understand about sex, life, partnership, and compatibility from just experiencing life in the presence of adults around you? Because it's not always parents. Sometimes it's grandparents, yeah. aunts, yeah, uncles, yeah. cousins. If you have older siblings like you for mm -hmm. um, your little sister, mm -hmm. What do what are you gleaning from those people in your life? Because it's not sex education is not a one time conversation. Mm -mm. It is not just the one time your mom, your dad sat you down and said, This is the birds and the bees. It is life. Mm -mm. Sex education is is life. And what you learn from the people around you and the environment that you're in. You know, we talk often about you know, using sex to manipulate. Mm-hmm. Right? Using sex to get things. We see that in movies we and in see books. It. It's it's like a common trope. All the time. All the time. Right? So, you know, some good takeaways for our audience today would be, yeah, really look at what messages have you received, whether from family or from mm -hmm. all of the things that Holland just mentioned. But also, yeah, look at movies, books, these types of things. In what way did people who share your identities use sex? What was mm -hmm. it for, right? And are you somewhere in the back of your head thinking that that is the purpose of sex? Yeah. I would really charge people to like pay attention to that tiny little voice in the mm -hmm. back of your head. I know I have a very loud back voice, <laughs> but some people probably don't. And like, what is it saying right. when you're making out with somebody? Mm -hmm. What is it saying when you're receiving mm -hmm. in sexual acts? What is it saying when you're giving? What is it saying when you're having penetrative intercourse? Mm -hmm. Like pay attention to the feelings you're feeling, the thoughts that are crossing your mind, the way your body is like reacting to certain things. And, like really lean into those things instead of just ignoring them and trying to like be what you think you quote unquote should be yes. doing. 
just really like listen, listen to yourself. And to piggyback up on that, also listen to the same things Helen just said when your body doesn't want to mm. be having sex. Mm -hmm. Okay, get curious, right? We'd love curiosity here. Um, okay, say a partner initiates in the same way they always initiate and you feel the bristle or you feel mm. the no or you feel the uh-uh. Yeah. Okay, uh, take a minute Go ask yourself some more questions. Yeah. What's coming up in my body? Where am I feeling this? Why don't I right now? Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to make a really crazy assumption that actually your body is wiser than you're giving it credit for. Mm -hmm. I think that if we got curious, if we pushed in, there might be some whys. You might not know how to fix it, and that's why we're here. That's why so many amazing resources are mm -hmm. here for you. But... There's probably a why. There probably is. And it could be something as simple as, well, they didn't unload the dishwasher like I asked them to Ooh, earlier. I was just and about to say the dishwasher. That meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not always sexual things that are attached mm -hmm. to these sexual mm -hmm. encounters. Mm -hmm. There is so much going on in our world, especially mm -hmm. when you've been partnered with someone for a longer amount of time, yes. even a short amount of time. Yes. It's Valentine's Day and they didn't get you flowers mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, you're in a situation ship and they uh -huh. haven't asked you to be their partner yet. Yes. Like these are all things that can affect your sexual desire for someone because you your sexual being and your emotional being and your intellectual being and all the other beings that are in your body, they're all interconnected. You can't just disconnect the sexual side of yourself and expect it to perform and not even perform. I guess that's the wrong word, but expect it to yeah. be happy to, mm -hmm. you know, go into mm -hmm. a sexual encounter when your other needs aren't being met. Yeah. And so, yeah, look at, look at the thing. <laughs> Preach it. Helen Banks and preach it. You know, I was thinking that I've talked to a couple people about this Esther Perel phrase recently, which is that for some of us, when we are tired and we when we have been in a realm all day that has asked us to stretch a muscle such as a communicatory muscle, mm. Sometimes we do want to reconnect with the person we love the most in the world using like the language of the body, yeah. using what Esther says is our native tongue. Yeah. I, you know, will sometimes work with couples and one usually in a gendered female body who has been raised with typical gender roles that present as female and a male body who has been raised in yeah. all of the male stereotypes. Okay. Um, woman has been conditioned to communicate really well, to expect others yeah. to communicate with her. He has been conditioned to think that women are better communicators, that it should be exhausting to him, and that he also really loves his wife. Yeah. Okay? And so they will have a disconnect sometimes of him wanting to come home and connect with her physically mm. when she doesn't feel connected to him emotionally. Yeah. And so that's a fun conversation to have with a spouse too, again, to get curious instead of, you're not meeting my needs. Instead saying, hey, why do you do this? Yeah. What do you enjoy Ask why about this? Yeah. yeah. And because uh, most of the time, again, you smart people listening to this podcast got in relationships because it was a really great person to get into a relationship with. Yes. And lots of times they just don't know how to explain to you what it is that they want and need. Yeah. And I, I don't think in abusive situations we should always be like assuming no. good intent and blah, no. blah, blah. No, no, I got out of 10 years of abuse. I... I do think, though, that if you're a partner to a person whose character you trust, mm. yeah, get a little curious because that is fascinating. Get a little curious and also, like, I don't know, recognize patterns, mm -hmm. talk to each other, have hard conversations. I think that's something we talk about communication so often. Literally daily. And I don't want you to think that we, like, dear audience, we don't want you to think that we think that communication's easy. No. It's not. No. I can fully acknowledge that. It is still very hard mm -hmm. for me. It is hard for me in my personal life. It is hard for me in my like relational life, romantic mm -hmm. life. It's not easy. Um, but it does get easier with time. It's yeah. a muscle that you exercise, especially within partnership, being able to say like, hey, I have a hard conversation I would like to have. Mm -hmm. Or like you told me the other day, here's this topic that I want to talk to you about. Do you have capacity for that right now? Yeah. Um, and if not, that's okay. Can we re revisit it later? But like, 
introducing communication slowly and like mm -hmm. stretching that muscle is helpful. It's not going to come easily the first time though. No, it's, it's hard. <laughs> and especially communicating about inherently vulnerable things. Absolutely. Or communicating in a way where we know we're going to stick to our needs, wants, and desires. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Helen brings up this thing that I teach that is almost asking consent mm -hmm. to have a consensual conversation, yep. right? It's saying basically, there's this thing I want to talk about, naming the thing, because sometimes we'll say to people, can we talk? And they're like, uh, can we just talk now? Yeah, right? it's like very middle school. Uh, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> state the thing. And because this shows agency and autonomy over self too. Yeah. Like, hey, I will be okay till we mm -hmm. schedule a time to talk about this thing, but it's important to me, yeah. right? Can we schedule a time between now and Saturday to talk about this thing? Yeah. Feels important, but a time when you're gonna be well-resourced, oh, person I'm talking to, yeah. when you'll feel good, when you'll have clarity. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes we spring conversations upon people, yeah. like when everybody's sleepy, like right yeah. before bed, and it's just not loving to anyone. Mm -hmm. We're not, our resiliency is not really high. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to wanting to want to have more sex, right, sometimes there's other nuanced things that we really need to unpack with a sexual mm -hmm. partner, right? Maybe some past trauma that mm -hmm. you need to talk about. Maybe, yeah, dividing the shared burdens and loads between partners. Maybe it's, yeah, I need a little more erotic friction in my life, yeah. right? Maybe, maybe I want to change up the way we're having sex. 100%. Maybe I yeah. need to teach you some more oral sex skills. Is there yeah. a way that I can coach you up? I tell most of my clients that it's not that they don't want sex, it's that they don't want that sex. Yeah. And showing someone the type of sex that we do want is life changing. It really is. And to Holland's point, highly uncomfortable in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Betty Dodson says that sexual skills are like any other skills, they have to be practiced. Mm -hmm. And a thing that I work on so often with clients is being uncomfortable in the discomfort mm. of learning a new skill. Communication is a new skill for so many yeah. of us. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. It is okay if you were just now picking up basketball, you would need to do a lot of dribbling drills. Yeah. Like a and whole lot. And it would lot. be uncomfortable. It would be so you hard. You can't not do things in life just because they're uncomfortable. Right. We really need to learn to push into uncomfortability mm. and be okay with that and understand that the outcome is worth it. Yes. Sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, I often say to, because I really believe in ease in this world and not having to constantly, mm -hmm. like, strive. Yeah. So this is my, like, litmus test. If the discomfort that you're experiencing aligns with your values, mm. then it is a value-based choice to be putting yourself in temporary discomfort for future gain and joy and ease. If, on the contrary, it doesn't align with your sexual values, you can stop. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you just can't. It, nobody need, it, this is the whole I want to want to have more sex. If you don't want to have more sex, yeah. you don't need to. If that's not something you actually want. No. Then don't. You literally don't <laughs> yeah. need to. Yeah. No. Oh, clients will often end sessions. And at the very last session, I always have this like wonderful, we recap everything. And the, one of the first questions is what, what's been one of your greatest takeaways, like greatest lessons from this time or greatest surprises. And people will often say, well, I'm just shocked that I'm not necessarily having more sex than when I started sessions. I'm like, oh, really? Why? Why do you say that? Because <laughs> like, I thought I would be like a stripper and a pole dancer by the time I left here. And I'm like, OK, well, what are you instead? And they will say, I'm just having the sex I want to have. And it's really good. That brings me so much joy. So much joy. Right? I Y'all, you could have shitty sex three times a day yeah. or really great sex three times a month. Or you could have really great sex three times a day if you want. Like 100%. It's whatever or once a year. you want. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think we all have this preconceived notion, this idea in our head of what we are supposed to want. And if you are living your life by the guidelines of what you think you are supposed to do, not by what you desire, not by what you want and what you need, then we need to realign your values. We need to look at inside of you and what you need, want, and desire rather than letting these outside forces say, oh, well, you're supposed to this, that, and the other. So we can't let that apply to our sexual lives too. 
of you're supposed to have sex, quote unquote. I think there was like a biblical thing mm-hmm. a few years ago that's like mm-hmm. the wife isn't having sex with her husband like two times a week or three mm-hmm. times a week. Mm-hmm. And I think that's honestly the preconceived notion is probably two or three times a week in married couples. I've seen that in a lot of places. Yeah. Well, if you're not having it, shout out to a, a client who mentioned it. I, their person read she was joking and said in some like men's health or like gq but we should find this yeah that men should be having sex penetrative intercourse three times a week i don't know where this bullshit is coming from like (laughs) show me the journal article that this connects to and the recent research yeah then i mean if you're hearing this kind of stuff y'all we need to start talking about masturbatory practices and sexual privacy and a right to sexual agency inside a partnership Mm -hmm. because if your body loves to orgasm you have hands yeah there are many fun toys on the market Mm -hmm. that you can use to stimulate your penis um if you don't want to use your own hands never should a person in relationship with us feel like they need to put out yeah to that's, meet some like quota yeah that's just it, it does not define a healthy partnership no, either no and it's it's Ugh. bordering uh, it's, on non-consensual uh-huh. like it's getting and transactional point, yes transactional non-consensual taking advantage of your person like they are so much more than that <laughs> There is there's so many nuances to this idea and let's just all agree it's bad. It's bad. We don't like it. Not in this household. No. <laughs> there's not happening here. No. I, again with the curiosity though too, there's so many fun curious conversations to have. Mm-hmm. You know, if you find that your person isn't initiating sex and you want them to well, then grow some balls, everybody of all genders. Grow some ovaries. And start asking for what you want. Yeah. It's really hot and it's really empowering. Yeah. Truly it is. Truly. I highly recommend using our smartphones and texting someone. Here's an easy cop out. Yeah. Pick up your phone right now. Text your person and tell them exactly the type of sex they've been imagining. Absolutely. What you've been imagining you do to them and what you've been imagining that they do to you. Yeah. And tell them that they are the hottest thing on this earth and tell them why you love their body and ask them if there's anything you can do to help make this type of sex happen within and give it a measurable time frame, like yeah. the next we love week. Time frames. Um, then they might say, wow, you know what? It's so hot that you asked me that. Yeah, actually, if you could align a babysitter, right? Or you could pick me up from work on this day and take me to a hotel. If we could have sex in the back seat after we drop the kid off at gymnastics, there are so many fun things to do, but just start asking. Don't instead just come at your person and say, we need to be having sex more. Uh, Be curious, get creative and communicate. Mic drop. Mic drop. I feel like we should wrap it up there. That was so good. (laughs) So good. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. Are you okay if we wrap up here? You say that like people don't like short podcasts, but I really feel like that was succinct. I feel like that was really good. It was really good. Y'all tell us. Holla says that the viewership goes down when we have shorter podcasts. You are welcome to extend your voice to this conversation. Yeah, please know in recap that, yeah, you get to have the sex that you want to have. And hypoactive sexual desire disorder is no longer a thing. Um, If some provider, if an obstetrician or a gynecologist or a psychologist tries to tell you this is a thing, say, I'm sorry, it's not. If someone tries to diagnose you with low libido, also seek out professional help. We can talk about the meds that you're on and lots of other things and your life. But most often, like Holland was saying, it's all those other pieces of you that aren't being attended to. So if you want to know more about any of the things we discussed today, you can go to www.sexitforyou.com forward slash free consult and you can request a consult that then Holland will decide if you get to have or not. So please be very specific in your request. Um, if you want to learn more, we mentioned sexual values a lot. Yeah. Do you think we can make that yeah, worksheet that. down here? Um, Holland will decide if you get like a special code or a discount You'll or something. She likes to have the power there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can follow us on Instagram at sex underscore ed. I finished recording. Damn. Mind. You finish it. At sex underscore ed underscore four underscore you. That's it. All right. Bye. Bye.